Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Most Wrestling Podcast. My name is Drake, being joined by El Don Lucha today. We are going to be predicting AEW Full Gear 2024, and that has to start with the main event, AEW World Championship on the line, John Moxley defending against a man who has defeated him before, I think exactly at the same pay-per-view a year ago for the International Championship. Almost. What what pay per view did Cassidy beat Moxley in? So the only reason why I know is because I was there live in attendance. It was all out twenty twenty four, or twenty twenty three. Sorry, all out twenty twenty three. Yeah. Dang, I wanted to say that because I thought he did, but then didn't. Uh, I don't know. I'm gonna not go there. Anyways, yeah. Uh, yeah so Orange Cassidy uh, now donning some black attire instead of the usual blue denim. Uh, he's gonna be taking on. Arguably one of the most ruthless men in AEW right now uh, because he seems to be going after anybody and everybody, including people like uh, J.D. Drake the other day, (laughs) which I kind of want to talk about that segment for a a second, if we may. Um, On Dynamite, it was being promoted as John Moxley takes over the TBS Superstation. And what that ended up being was what they usually do is Max comes through the crowd. They beat up J.D. Drake for no reason. Like, it does not get touched on later. (laughs) Nobody comes to save him. Uh, Moxley has some words for Cassidy, and that's about it. So instead of a takes over the super station, it was more a we'll hear from John Moxley. You know, that type of promo. So first off, Don Lucha, to me, that seems like, a major step down from where the Deaf Riders were a couple weeks ago with the whole babyface locker room outside waiting outside the arena for them to arrive so that they could beat them down. Whereas now it's just, uh, they stroll right in. What do you think? It just, uh, the way it was advertised versus the way it played out, it's two completely different things. Like going into it, as you said, it was uh, advertised as John Moxley. He takes over, like, takes over the TBS network, Super Siege, I believe was the word it was called or something like that. But all we got out of it was he took over J.D. Drake and that was it. (laughs) He didn't do anything. Like, I would have loved it if we would have got some, like, if let's say, for example, they go to picture in picture and instead of the action, John Moxley and crew, they cut off the action and it's them talking about what they're doing and why they're doing it and what they want to see in the future out of the AEW locker room. That's like the, what they're lacking pretty much is the reason why they're doing what they're doing is because they want everybody to step up and make AEW the place that it needs to be. But when just, can I, can like, I clarify any, something? Can I clarify ahead, something? Go there? Ahead, go ahead. When you say go picture in picture, do you mean like go to commercial except the commercials are Moxley and crew cutting some sort of promo while the action's going on the other so, screen? Yes. Yeah, so, so you know how when they cut, so specifically I would say picture in picture because the other commercials, it's like those, you can't really like take them out and replace them with just John Moxley ad because that's how you make your money, truth be told. But like specifically for picture in picture speaking, you know how they cut away and then obviously yeah. one side is the commercial and one side's the action still in the ring? Instead of the in-ring stuff, Cut that off and just have John Moxley there talking or whatnot or something <laughs> similar to that to make it seem like well, John Moxley and company right now should have your attention more than the current match because ultimately he's more important and his group is trying to get the attention of everybody and that to me would be a proper way of taking over the TBS station and superseding it and whatnot. Yeah, more than yeah. what we already got versus just taking that, out JD Drake. That would have been hilarious. I love this idea. All right, keep it going. What? What? Yeah, so with with Orange, ways you could go about it too. Yeah, with Orange Cassidy, um, he does feel much more serious than when we first saw him against Pac at Revolution 2020. If you remember that, um, he is uh, coming to his own, and uh, now he's has to be basically the veteran in this group of youngsters, young upstarts, the future of AEW, as he called them, and. I think that this is going to be a very good first opponent for John Moxley. Uh, I think for this match, what it's a foregone conclusion Moxley's going to retain, right? So I'm not interested in predicting that. That's that's 
uh, you know, it's going to happen, right? Whereas Moxley and Danielson last month, that was kind of, a, you didn't know which way it was going to go, honestly. But this one, I don't want to see Moxley only win. I want him to continue to send these messages to the locker room that we are going to destroy each and every one of you and force you to become better professional wrestlers. And so I think that is what I hope he does to Orange Cassidy here, where in the same way they attacked Danielson after that match, I think you do something similar with Orange Cassidy. I don't know if you do the whole bag over the head or maybe you do an angle where they break his arm with a steel chair or something. They did, they've done the neck with Chuck Taylor, right, with the steel chair around the neck. Why not do the same thing to Orange Cassidy? Maybe even have Wheeler Yuta be the one to do it to Orange Cassidy to, like, continue to show he is a disciple of this who by the way is another aspect i want to touch on in a little bit but what do you think john lucha what should be going on in the main event of full gear do you should it just be a wrestling match or should there be a larger angle that takes place no i don't think there should it should just be just a traditional wrestling match i think there's too much story um of outside of the wrestling aspect of things that are revolving around the story for it to just end on a simple wrestling match. I think there should be, well, I don't know if there should be, but I think there will be some sort of like angle, like you said, whether it be the plastic bag, maybe that's their signature thing from now on is that's the way that they get people to take it to the next level is the bag. But I, I'm agree. I'm in agreement with you, man. I, I just don't want it to be something simple as well. Moxley wins clean or Moxley just wins straight up. And then that's that like, there has to be something, I think, where Moxley beats down OC because even though OC is kind of turning a different page here and he's not the just pockets denim gimmick, I still don't think we've got into the full-fledged, like, final arc of Orange Cassidy. So I think there's something else that needs to be done in order for him to fully, like, let loose, fully snap, and then finally be able to reach that full entire potential that... Mox and company sees that they're trying to get across the Orange Cassidy, but we haven't got to that point yet. So I think something along those lines should happen, whether it be, you, like you said, breaking the arm or with the chair, the bag, the murder, uh, whatever it may be. I just think something needs to happen here. Absolutely. Um, I, Wheeler Yuta, I brought him up. I think he... I like his role right now in the Death Riders. I like him a lot in this position um, because... When it was, I think it was Orange Cassidy or somebody else talking to Wheeler, Yuta being like, don't you see that they're just using you? That And you have Wheeler, Yuta shouting back at him, they're not using me, I'm my own man. And as he's shouting this, Claudio next to him just shouts, shut up, shut up. And he's holding him back and whatever, like, but not in like a, not in that stereotypical way of, of like, you know, throwing their whole body to hold him back, but just one hand on him, uh, almost like a coach or a mentor or something like that. I don't know. But again, I like that he is kind of being treated like garbage in a way um, where he is only a soldier in this game, right? In this war that the Deaf Riders have. Um, so much so when they were going to leave the arena, they were, you see everybody jumping into the truck except Wheeler Yuta, and they were going to take off without him. They were going to take off without him. It was only when Claudio opened the door, Darby Allen jumped on his back, and we had an awesome visual of Claudio sprinting like 20 yards, throwing Darby into the garage, and then doing a, a swing into the garage door. Nuts. Fantastic. That's why Claudio needs to be in the C2 right there. But... Wheeler Yuta, uh, and uh, I brought that up because Wheeler Yuta got, then had the opportunity to jump into the truck because they had no choice but to wait for him. They were going to leave him initially. So Wheeler eventually will be an opponent for Moxley in, in the future. I don't know how distant, but I think right now they're setting up the groundwork for it. What do you think of uh, Yuta in this position as a soldier for the Death Riders? I like it because it gives him, like, a sort of direction that we should be looking out for not only now, but a couple months down the road, because like you said, they're playing the seeds here and it's something that we've seen. I feel like 
time and time again in the wrestling uh, environment where you push somebody too far, eventually they're going to snap. You keep pushing somebody um, and you keep treating somebody like they're less than you as a group, even though as a group you're supposed to be united as one. And you pointed something out a couple weeks ago and at first I disagreed with you, but now I think I see where, you're, where, you're, where your head was at because you had mentioned uh, when the plan was to take out OC and it seemed like Wheeler didn't know the plan and was kind of left out of it. At first, I was in disagreement with you, but now I see that it probably was the truth because we see it every week. They treat this guy, like you said, like garbage, man. Like, whether it be Claudio telling him, like, shut up when he's just standing up for himself and he's just responding to what OC saying to him. Or Moxley he's slapping him, him, shut him in up the and face. Basically, exactly. Little things where they're just treating him like the little brother of the group, sometimes even worse. And it's just going to come to a point where Wheeler's going to have enough. And he's going to snap and he's going to eventually, like you said, take on John Moxley. It's just a matter of how well they're going to capitalize off Wheeler leaving the group. Because eventually I think that's the ultimate goal mm. is him leaving the group. How well can you establish that? Because this is going to make him into something. No well, doubt about it. It's going to make him into something. It's just going after that. What happens next? My hope is he would get elevated into the TNT title area that Jack Perry and Daniel Garcia are in right now. So let's go ahead and transition to that match. TNT Championship Garcia, uh, who has gotten into the face of Jack Perry and the Young Bucks for not stepping up to the Deaf Riders, for not stopping them when the Young Bucks and Jack Perry had every opportunity to. Um, and so Garcia has pinned Jack against the wall before and... Jack came had a very good point. Perry had a very good point, and he said something along the lines of, they're dancing for you, huh? Yeah, they used to do that for me too. And kind of like just reminded me of like Brian Danielson when he was the global champion and the world's champion, and he was saying, you people are fickle, fickle. And I, I think Jack Perry might feel the same way about the AEW universe. Um but what has really <laughs> taken a step forward in this feud? I don't know if you watched this on Collision. I think it was Collision at the very least. Positive. Uh, during Daniel Garcia's match, Jack Perry was beating up Matt Menard. And he was tying him up to the back of a truck. To the, 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 the truck that Jack Perry drives, you know? Um, to like... Yeah. You know, to drive him with behind him, like to, to drive with him behind him and, and skin him alive, really. And <laughs> Dana Garcia just gets there in time to fight Jack Perry. And then the the two are on top. They cut to commercial, right? And we come back and Jack Perry is fully wrapped around the hood and like the bumper of his truck by the chain and they get in the car and they genuinely drive with him strapped to the front and they are hitting things like barricades genuinely terrifying um what do you think of this feud do you like the links that this has gone to and do you think that it is uh worth those links uh, i think it's definitely different it's ultimately it's what AEW is really all about um being the alternative, because obviously um, you're not going to see this kind of stuff really on WWE. It's just, it's not what their audience is really built for. And that's the perfect thing about this is that because of AEW, we get to see this kind of things where it's not traditional, but in the moment it gets you like, it makes you feel something. And whether you like it, whether you don't like it, whether you think it's too much or whether you think it's just perfect for the moment, it makes you feel something. And truly that's what professional wrestling is like about. Um, cause you don't want to just be there and just wishing for something to end and you don't really care for it because then it's just, you're, it's no fun in that. And this rivalry specifically, it has aspects of that where I'm like interested in whatever they're doing, whether it be them tying each other up to the, to the truck, as you say, and, and going to drive around town with somebody on the hood or the back, or even down to simple line breakdowns, like you said, with Jack Perry, when he used to dance through the, with the crowd doing the chant. And now all of a sudden he's no longer that he's past that and he sees daniel garcia in somewhat of a similar light i like it i like it it's, it's something that it's it's i feel like we haven't really seen all too much 
But specifically, I like it because it's between two guys that aren't like stereotypical in the WWE or in the wrestling aspect that come from WWE. Like this isn't something that you see between like let's say Adam Copeland and a Ricochet, for example. No, these are two homegrown people for the most part here that are putting on like actual entertainment and actual stories that are worth watching. And that's what I love about this because if you would have asked me five years ago, do I care about Jack Perry? Do I even know who Jack Perry is? No. But now I'm actually interested because of stuff like this. And it's the little things such as going the extra mile where you have to break glass or you have to set something on fire or tie something to the to a vehicle. It goes the extra mile to get the the viewer invested. And truly, I'm invested into this storyline right now. Because there's sure there's things left and right that you can nitpick and that you may not like. And I'll get to them at some point. But like overall, I'm enjoying this. And I really think that it's worth the lengths that they're going to. Do you think Daniel Garcia wins the TNT Championship? Yes, I do, actually. Because I Me think too. it's going to lead to maybe a little bit of a disappearance of some sort from Jack Perry. Um, just his counterparts are somewhat gone right now, the Young Bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know the case with Okada. Obviously, we have the C2 coming up, so we know he's not going to be gone for too long. But I think Daniel Garcia winning this gives somewhat of Jack Perry a little bit of a reset um, in terms of like creative ability, but still being able to be the scapegoat, still keeping true to like who he is now and who he's built. So I think I want to see Daniel Garcia win. Interesting. Yeah, I think Daniel Garcia is going to win for sure. Not for sure, but I think he he it felt like he should have be eaten MJF at uh, All Out, and uh, this time they have to capitalize on his momentum. They have to, and if he doesn't win, I don't know what's going to happen to Daniel Garcia. Um, but for Jack Perry, yeah, I was considering what what is the elite going to look like in the future? Because like, do you just see Perry and Okada hanging out? I don't. And with the young bucks gone and reportedly they're going to come back baby faces to fight off the deaf riders. I, it seems like they are going to be breaking away from Jack Perry. Cause I don't see Jack Perry turning baby face anytime soon. Um, and in terms of a break, maybe he does go for a break from AEW. I personally would put Perry in the C2. I think he's a great body to be in there because he is someone who is beatable in that and can get some big wins as well. Um, but uh, I think he is probably going to be doing something in New Japan for Wrestle Kingdom and Wrestle yeah. Dynasty. So I don't know exactly what. I'm not entirely sure. But that is my idea is that he's going to do something at Wrestle Dynasty. Uh, Go ahead. But I was going to say real quick uh, with the Jack Perry thing, and even if he does go away for just a little bit, I think we just mentioned a possibility of Wheeler Yuta leaving the Death Riders or getting kicked out of the Death Riders. That right there is an easy fix, an easy plug-in right there as Jack Perry joining the Death Riders in some way. I think especially because we've seen the backstage segment and we've talked about it where John Moxley has said to Jack Perry, like, I like what you've become. Um, you're not so bad yourself, whatever it was that he said. So I think he has a soft spot for Perry and who he's become. But I think that's an easy plug-in if you take away Wheeler and establish Wheeler as his solo self. Plug in Jack Perry with the Death Riders. I like that. Absolutely. It's a great idea. Well, what could arguably be the most fun match of the night? We'll see how it goes because both of these guys are amazing in the ring. I'm talking about Will Ospreay versus Kyle Fletcher in fighting, uh, well, splitting off from the Don Callis family, Kyle Fletcher, ending a years-long uh, friendship with Will Ospreay. Um, Mark Davis coming back into the fold to confront Will uh, to confront Kyle Fletcher to be like, what are you doing with Don? But at the same time, he's also mad at Will. Uh, in one of their like exclusive YouTube videos, he was PO'd at uh, Will Osprey because like Will introduced Kyle to Don Callis. He wouldn't be in the situation if Will didn't uh, first be the first one to make a deal with the devil, right? And so, uh, I am loving Kyle Fletcher right now. I think that he has 
elevated his game. And I've been watching him closely for the past year since Mark Davis has been gone because he truly, truly astounded me with how good of an in-ring solos guy he is because I've only known him as a tag team guy. I've only seen him in Aussie Open, and they were my favorite tag team for a time being. But I didn't realize how good Kyle would be by himself. And he he is really, really good. Um, even down, not just in the ring, even down to his promos, Kyle Fletcher has the intensity and the attention of the crowd that he needs to be a main eventer in AEW. I think it personally would be a travesty if Kyle Fletcher loses this match at full gear because you are, we have criticized WWE before, especially me during the John Cena era, where you have an opportunity to make a new guy, and if you don't capitalize on it, well, that's less stars that can sell tickets for you, right? So Kyle needs to win this match, and I don't think it's going to be a clean one. We can possibly fantasy book that, but I do think Kyle has to win against Will Ospreay down Lucha. I think, yeah, 100% he has to win. I think it would just, it would be creative malpractice if he doesn't win because all the story, like, Will Ospreay set. He's made. He's a made man. He Win or lose, Will Ospreay has his place. But giving Kyle Fletcher a big win here that's not only over Will Ospreay, but you got to think about it, man. Like, pay-per-view wins are, like, exclusive. They don't come often. And so... Getting a pay-per-view win on uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest name you can get on AEW currently today, that's huge. That, Like you said, that makes people. And so having Kyle Fletcher lose, I'm not interested in that one bit. But um, I'm giving it a chance because unlike you, I, I just haven't been all that invested in Kyle Fletcher, truth be told. Like his in-ring work... No doubt. It's he's great. He's phenomenal in the ring. I'm not saying that it's like he's bad or nothing. It's just to me it's too much like Osprey in a way that I just it's it's nothing that I can get behind at the moment. But I am though excited for the match because it gives me a chance to to see what Kyle Fletcher can really do and gives me a chance to really like see what he's all about. That's that's my take on that. But isn't Kyle's character part of his character is the hypocrisy of claiming, yelling into the camera, I am nothing like you, Will Ospreay. I am nothing like you. I am nothing like you. But then on the other side of the token, he has learned from Ospreay to turn on people like Okada, to injure people like Kenny Omega, to drive a screwdriver in the skull of somebody. All of that has come from Will Ospreay. And Ospreay pointed this out on the last Dynamite where he said, this is hypocritical, so what is it? Are you going to be nothing like me or are you just a Walmart version of Will Ospreay? Right? So I I think it is important to this story that he wrestles a little bit like Ospreay, honestly. So – Either way, no, uh, it, go ahead. It yeah, it definitely is different. Um, like, I think th that's part of on me as well because I'm going to be honest with everybody watching. Like, I'm a fair weather fan. Like, I'm not sitting and watching and, like, paying attention to every single story that AEW puts out. But I also don't want to give my opinion on something that I just am completely, like, have no knowledge over. And so that's why when I say the things about what I say about Kyle Fletcher, it's not so much me saying it because I don't believe in him or whatnot. It has to do part of it because I'm not fully, like, all the way um, caught up with the current story. Like, when you mentioned the things about, about uh, Will Ospreay and saying, well, I learned this from you, but at the same time, like, well, I'm nothing like you. Like, I didn't think about the whole screwdriver and the turning on people situation, but, like, he learned that from Will, but in a way, didn't Will learn the screwdriver thing from Don Callis? Sure, sure. You can make that so, argument. So I mean, that, Don so Callis wasn't... Like that. Don Callis was not in his ear when uh, Osprey turned on Okada. Okada back in New yeah, Japan. Yeah, so that's what... Things like that. I'm not I'm not too caught up on the whole New Japan, uh, like, lore as well with Osprey, but, like, stuff like that, I feel like it gives bigger meaning and bigger importance to the overall aspect of what they're trying to do, especially with, like, the character of Kyle Fletcher, 
Because like I'm mentioning right now, like to me, that may not seem like much, but somebody like you that's caught up with it and knows the history of Osprey, knows the history of Fletcher and what they shared together at a point in time. Like to you, that makes this storyline so much better. And that to me, like, that's what I like about it because I'm not saying it's a bad rivalry one bit. And even though I'm not caught up entirely with it, I can still tell you that I, I like the way it's going. I think it's going to be a great match. And I think Kyle Fletcher should win versus if you would have asked me, I had no knowledge at all. I would have been like, well, to be honest, I don't really care. Will Ospreay's the bigger name. He should win. I don't know if that makes sense there. Yeah. What I'm saying. Yeah. No, and the history for these two is it's a big deal in this match. And not to go over every little bit of it, but yeah, Osprey and Kyle, Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis basically sleeping on Osprey's couch at one point uh, when they were still making it in the indie scene. Uh, and in New Japan, the United Empire that Osprey formed, he brought in Aussie Open. The, that was his tag team of the group. And the I loved the United Empire. There was a point in time where they were my favorite faction in wrestling. And with the um, this this year's Dog Pound Steel Cage match against the War Dogs in February, that was pinnacle, like perfect ending of the of the Osprey led United Empire um, in New Japan. But and that actually wasn't even with Aussie Open, which is crazy to think about. But anyways. Um, Back to this match. I think one interesting aspect of this is Kyle Fletcher's longtime tag team partner, Mark Davis. Very surprising return. I'm going to guess that he's cleared because he's been in a couple brawls since. No matches, but brawls. I think Mark Davis sides with Kyle Fletcher during this match. I think he's going to cost Osprey the match. And... I don't know if that's going to be great or not. Um, this is this is thinking about it right now. This is what I'm hoping for: Aussie Open reunite under the Don Callis family, building to Wrestle Dynasty January 5th. I think on the New Japan side, you have the United Empire boys being ticked off. And being mad, we've already caught a couple glimpses of it. I think Jeff Cobb has shouted at Kyle Fletcher in some of his backstage comments in New Japan recently, being like, "What are you doing?" That sort of deal. Uh, right now, it's not my favorite tag team, but the IWGP Heavyweight Tag Team Champions are the United Empire's Hanare and the Great Okan. So you could probably do those two versus Aussie Open, United Empire versus the United Empire at Wrestle Dynasty. And maybe, maybe you do something crazy by have Kyle and Mark win back the IWGP heavyweight tag titles. I would not be opposed to that at all. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on Mark Day? I know you haven't watched his whole uh, career and all that, but do you think Mark Davis could be playing an important part in this role? Yeah, one hundred percent, bro. Because well, like you just, I'm not too familiar on it, but. Seeing his return, like, I do know they were the tag team. I do know they were together, the United Empire. And so my only dilemma with this, bro, and hear me out here, but if you have Mark Davis side with Kyle Fletcher and the United Empire and they reform, does it take away, or not take away, but does it necessarily waste a Kyle, a Kyle Fletcher singles win over Will Ospreay if you're just inserting them back into tag team action. But, okay, so now that's if you have Mark Davis side with them. Yeah. Now hear me out on if Mark Davis sides with Will Ospreay, though, because here's the dilemma with that. Does Mark, or is Mark Davis going to be able to establish himself as a singles guy enough to ride solo? Without the Don Callis family and without Kyle Fletcher, this is what. I don't, how do you feel about it? This is what I can say to Mark Davis as a singles guy. Um, he caught my eye during the New Japan Cup a couple years ago. It was a singles tournament. Um, he got eliminated in round three, I want to say, when him, 
and Will Ospreay had to meet in like the quarterfinals. U U Empire United Empire versus United Empire, fantastic match. Now, given it was with Will, Will Ospreay, you know I couldn't tell you Davis's first two opponents right. honestly. <laughs> given it was with Will Ospreay, uh, it was one of my favorite New Japan matches of the year because I did not see it hitting that hard and being that good. Um, unfortunately, for Ospreay, he got injured during that match, and so even though he won and qualified to move on. Because his his injury, Mark Davis moved on into the next round, with with Will Ospreay's blessing, you know, their teammates still. So. Right. And Davis, in that round where he was the uh, person that was filling in for somebody else, got the upset victory and moved on to the semifinals. And I remember being very very surprised. Maybe because of the result, but I do remember that enjoying that match. And I want to say it was against like Evil or something like that. So not like a great opponent, but I it, I remember being surprised that he won for sure. You know. So either way, I think Davis, you could do something. I say that with every wrestler, honestly. You could, as long as you turn yourself up to a ten, turn it up to an eleven. I think you can make it into something for sure. Let's move on here, uh, keep the pace going. Maybe a team or a faction that you do know the history of, that being the Hurt Syndicate. Bobby Lashley is going to be in his first AEW match against Swerve Strickland at full gear. Let's talk first about the formation of the Hurt Syndicate and AEW, Don Lucha. Do you like them dealing out all these cards to these people like real Leo Rush, specifically Max Caster of the Acclaimed, to Mercedes Monet? And they have openly said that if you deny these cards, you're against us. We want you to join us, but you would be against us. So what do you think of the Hurst Syndicate right now with MVP's kind of a managerial skills in AEW? I am excited because this is the first time we get to do this with the Hurt Business, or formerly known as the Hurt Business, now the Hurt Syndicate. This is the first time we get to do this in front of a live crowd, in front of a live audience at all. Um, last time we saw them was during the COVID period. And so now I, I want to see what, what they do because... I was a fan of the first run. Obviously, it was legendary with Bobby winning the title and MVP transforming these guys that were felt like they were stalling in some way, and then they got to the top. And so now we're getting this new rendition of the Hurt Business, and will we see a new member? Like you mentioned, Leo Rush, uh, who was the other one? Mercedes. The, I Max think Caster. now on two different occasions. Max Caster was another one, but I think on two different occasions now, if not three, they have approached Ricochet as well. And so yep, that's, the I was forgetting. That's, that's, that's interesting because obviously we know them to be a group of four in WWE. And we know Shelton Benjamin, or not Shelton Benjamin, Cedric Alexander earlier this year, I believe, re-signed with the WWE. So he won't be making a jump. But it's like they're looking to get that fourth member. Who will it be? I think Leo Rush is a perfect name for it. If they want to add somebody like a Ricochet as well, I wouldn't be against it. Um, previously, I had mentioned a few names like uh, I believe it was a Powerhouse Hobbs as well. I feel like that could work well because you could yes. turn Shelton Benjamin and Powerhouse as this giant unit tag team that Absolutely. can run through the division. But overall, I'm excited for this Hurt Syndicate uh, story and this direction that they're going because I want to see what they do in front of a live crowd. I was uh robbed of it the first time. I'm getting it now. I'm excited. I think everything that they have done so far has been money. I think they are printing money, money yes, right sir. now. Um, yes. I, if you, if you didn't watch, they did a interview with Renee Perquette on the YouTube channel, her show called Close Up, and they talked about wanting to elevate younger guys, and that's why they're dealing out those cards. I think I want everybody who has been given a card to join it except for Swerve Strickland. I want Max yeah. Caster to split from the Acclaimed. I want him because uh, I think the Acclaimed is, is done and over. I think it's washed at this point, and they need to do something different. Specifically, I think Bowens needs to go into the singles uh, action. And so I think Max Caster kind of becoming the fall guy for the Hurt Syndicate wouldn't be a terrible move. I mean, somebody's got to do it. Uh, I think Leo Rush 
with the history of Bobby Lashley for sure can fit into there. Uh, and he, I said this the other week, it's like a Pokemon evolution between Leo Rush, Shelton Benjamin, and Bobby Lashley. It's, it's hilarious. Um, and then the last name, uh, Ricochet. Ricochet, who he has got heelish tendencies in New Japan at the very least because he attacked Zack Sabre Jr. after his main event match at Power Struggle uh, and announced that he's going to fight for the IWGP heavyweight title uh, on January 5th against whoever the champion is, Sabre Jr. or Shota. It's going to be Sabre Jr. But uh, I think a ricochet... And think about this. This is a crucial point about Ricochet joining the Hurt Syndicate. Is his finisher is no longer the 630 senton. I have noted that since his start in AEW, where his finisher is now the sliding lariat, I want to say. And it is not, like, pretty in the same sense that the 630 senton is. It's not flashy. It's not getting people out of their seats. But it is more rugged and more uh, malicious, I want to say, than the 630. So I think Ricochet joining this group would be really good for his uh, current character arc in the way that they're doing it. And he's already got the suit to go with it. Um, is there any of the names so far down Lucha that have been given a card that you think should deny it and become a victim to the Hearst Syndicate? Or is there a name that pops in your head that they try to recruit and they say no? Well, well obviously, I think the Swerve one was spot on. He should absolutely not join just because he's his own person. Like, Swerve doesn't need to be with the Hearst Syndicate to get any bigger than he already is. Swerve did that on his own with Nana and... I think he's a perfect opponent to start off the Hurt Syndicate's uh, journey in AEW. Um, it's one of the biggest names, if not the biggest name right now in AEW currently. And with what you asked me with who I want to see and who I think could fit, Ricochet, I think, is number one on my list. Um, it's been, I think, said time and time again by many people. He's not the greatest on the mic. And... Although it hasn't been totally bad in AEW, I feel like it hasn't gotten any better. And so allowing him to be in the Hurt Syndicate here, on top of what you mentioned with his uh, current style of wrestling and his like finisher, his finisher now, the way he's doing stuff nowadays, having him being behind probably the best talker in the AEW right now, MVP, uh, in the managerial position, is, I think, a smart move to make. Um, and specifically because with the Hurt Business, it's like, think about it with them three right now. Bobby, Shelton, and MVP, the way that they're establishing the three, it's like we haven't even seen Bobby Lashley yet. And from WWE, we know like the ceiling that he has. He's a main eventer. We know that we've seen that. But think about with MVP and with Shelton, they have already made Shelton Benjamin feel like such an important piece of this roster in almost a month time that WWE couldn't even do in almost 20-something years of having him on the roster. And MVP is no longer an in-ring competitor, but by God, let me tell you, the way he does on the mic and the way he delivers everything and, like, the way he just presents things, to me, like I mentioned, he's second to none. As far as managerial goes, speaking on the mic, MVP is the guy. And so... I'm excited then to what they can make Bobby Lashley seem like and if they add a Ricochet, what they can make Ricochet uh, seem like. But the only name that I don't want to see necessarily, I don't think we will see with uh, the Hurt Syndicate, is uh, Max Caster. And that's because I think AEW specifically have this thing with the Acclaim that they just love them too much that they just won't break them up. They'll, they'll mess around with them being heel. They'll mess around with them being tweeners or whatnot. But I just think they love the acclaim too much to break them up. And it's unfortunate because Bowens needs that solo run. It, the acclaim has ran its course already. And I just think Bowens would actually fare well, I think, in the Hurt Syndicate. That would be a name that I would like to see more than Max Caster. Uh, two important things I want to point out from what you had to say there. One, MVP. Even when he grabbed the mic to interview Bobby Lashley, he grabbed it from Renee. That was perfect. 
Everything that he does is perfect. The pimp cane is he looks so cool with it, dude. Like I like that just started because like he got like hurt one Monday Night Raw or whatever, but like it makes yeah, it, it fills out his character. Um I love MVP right now. And I didn't even really think about yeah, he is probably one of the number one talkers in AEW um at this point. But the other thing that I wanted to point out was yeah, Bobby Lashley showed he could be a major world champion. I was all in on Bobby Lashley when he beat Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania 38. I so wanted know. him to retain against Drew McIntyre that night. And I was that was like the the start of the hurt. No, it was, that was after the hurt business, yeah. wasn't it? No. Yeah, it was after a little I think it was just him and MVP together. I don't think the group yeah. itself I think they might have got back together for like a short stint later mm-hmm. on in the year, but at that point in time, it was just MVP and Bobby Lashley. Yeah, and I think it was Mania 37. I want to correct myself. Mania 37. It was yeah, definitely uh, the one after COVID. When because I remember him and Drew McIntyre was like the first match, first Mania match back. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, let's keep the ball rolling here. TBS Championship on the line, Mercedes Monet. Uh, she's going to be defending against Chris Statlander, who is inexplicitly a babyface now. Uh, Mercedes now uh, yelling at her heavy, what's her name? Uh, Camille. 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 Uh, just like telling Camille she's stupid. She can't do anything right. Ever since she lost to Chris Statlander, uh, Mercedes has been holding a grunge against Camille. And. Um, We've seen Chris Statlander take out Camille's arm with a car door in the car door. We've seen her bust them both through a wall. Um, I uh, want to say that um, this feud is not doing it for me. It's a combination of Chris Statlander just being a babyface all of a sudden, no longer with Stokely Hathaway, no storyline reason whatsoever. It's also a combination of I don't think Mercedes is – a very good actor as much as she believes she is and so i don't necessarily believe everything that she's doing i think she's still a great wrestler but um and then camille is i don't think i have any interest in camille as a performer she, she had the match with chris statlander it wasn't great and uh i don't know what to say more about this other than that and this is a larger thing problem, but the women's division in AEW right now is not Ooh, get getting any do not attention. Get me Continue. Do not get me started. Well, I do want okay, to talk. Let's so, talk about TBS title first. Yeah, okay. Um, I was going to say, let me start off with the TBS title and, and what we're going here. It's unfortunate because those are two of your biggest attractions in your women's division. Like, for sure, like, when you think of the AEW women's divisions, those are two of, if not, like, top five names that you think of instantly. And it's just unfortunate that this build and this storyline to this match just hasn't got me interested in the slightest. Um, And it has everything to do with every reason that you mentioned. Chris Statlander, all of a sudden, becoming this baby face and somebody that we should start, like, cheering for and agree with, all of a sudden, because her only goal with being a bad or a heel was to take down her best friend who ne- didn't necessarily do anything to her. And they're using that as the reason for the turn. It's just lazy. It's just very lazy to me. Like, we didn't even get a single segment with Stokely and Chris Statlander even addressing this situation. It's just lazy to me. Why Why do we have to take the lazy approach when it comes to the women with this? Because you know if it was the men's side of things, they would go the extra mile to make sure that you knew that all the plot holes were at least filled in. Because you know they hate the criticism when it comes to their biggest storylines. So why couldn't do they, they do the same thing here? And now moving over to Camille. What do I care for her, her as a uh, bodyguard in a sense? What good is she as a bodyguard? If she's the one running away from Chris Statlander, just like Mercedes is, why should I have any sort of belief that she's the powerhouse of the group? What differentiates her character right now at this moment from Raquel Rodriguez in WWE as the bodyguard? 
They are both the same exact character right now. Bland, boring, and useless. Well, and then Raquel was at least protected on Raw. At least Raquel was protected on Raw. The world champion got pinned. (laughs) And that's the problem because she's at least they're protecting her in that sense. With Camille, they're not even putting her in matches enough for me to believe that she's this powerhouse or this brick house that they're making her out to be. It's lazy. There's no effort into it. And it's annoying. And leading over to Mercedes, because she's one of the greatest of this generation. (laughs) Like, we saw her work as Sasha Banks. That's the reason why, like, the hype and, like, the value of her name coming into what was a big business in April or March it was. The hype was at an all-time high for her debut because of what she's done previously. And, yes, she's won championships. And the matches themselves haven't, like, they haven't disappointed for the most part. But what's gone on other than the matches themselves? What story? Like, we haven't got a memorable Mercedes story since she's been in AEW. The whole Britt Baker uh, Mercedes story, flop. Don't, we don't even hear about that anymore. The Hikaru Shida stuff, it wasn't the worst thing, but the match itself flopped. The Willow stuff, I will give it itself. They have the history and the match was amazing. So that, to me, was the only thing that Mercedes has done, the memorable as of this moment now. And it's unfortunate because she's one of the greatest in the world today. AEW, I need you to stop being lazy with the booking of the women's division, man. It's very annoying and it's very frustrating. It doesn't stop with the TBS title. There is a match that is glaringly absent on this full gear card. Two months ago, it felt like the biggest thing in the women's division. When Mariah May turned on Tony Storm and bloodied her up and won the Women's World Championship at All In in front of Wembley Stadium. Since Mariah May has won that title, they have done nothing of importance with her. It has been failed after failed uh, champagne celebrations. We have been waiting for Mina Shirakawa to come into AEW, to come back. And then when she does, she quite literally gets into a match about tits. I'm not even kidding. Like, that's not misogynistic. It was literally those two fighting over how big their chests were. And then you also have Mariah defending against Anna Jay, which that's great. Elevate Anna Jay. That's fine. Make that collision, you know, you got to watch the women's world title match. Sure. But this has division. This Mariah May push has been put on ice since Tony Storm has been gone. We are just waiting. That's what we are in. We are in a hamster wheel waiting for Tony Storm to get back to AEW. And that is so disappointing to see that's how you capitalize on your momentum with Mariah May as the world champion. Is this also the first pay-per-view where the women's world championship isn't on there? Is this the first AEW pay-per-view without a women's world title match? Because at least when Jamie Hayter had to drop the title because she was injured, you did have some sort of segment for it. You did something with it. This is embarrassing and if i was mariah may i would be ticked 100 percent, dude uh, like when the news came out that the reason why a or mariah may signed to AEW was because tony khan had proposed this year-long storyline with timeless tony storm and that was the reason i knew from that point on it was going to be a case of well what comes after that Because if you're just relying on that one single story, and that's the one thing that that's the reason why you're going to this place, they're not going to capitalize on you afterwards. Because once you're done with that, they have nothing for you. And we've seen this. Now we've got this. Like when they announced Anna J was going to be the next competitor for the women's championship, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I was a little bit upset. And it was because we're going from timeless Tony Storm. To then, it was a couple weeks of Yuka Sakazaki, uh, Sakazaki, I think. And then we went on to Willow Nightingale. Then you're dropping down to Anna J. But then I had to eat my words because Anna J held her own. She did come back from the excursion, so it made all the sense to showcase her. And she didn't disappoint. But why couldn't we have that then end up on this pay-per-view here? 
Why couldn't you just showcase not only your women's world champion, but this other person who you just sent on an excursion and have future big plans for? Showcase her as well on top of this because you gave her a win not too long ago against this same competitor. So showcase her on this match because you know she's not going to win the championship, but putting her on the pay-per-view match and having her establish herself as a focal point of the women's division would be so much better than me waiting to see what the hell's going to happen on full gear with a celebration of, like you said, tits between Mina Shirakawa and Mariah May. Like, why did we, like, devalue Mina Shirakawa's actual in-ring ability and her character that she can deliver to just down to just her breast? That's literally all Mina down, uh, is down to. That's all AEW is presenting her down to. Why are we doing this? Why are we going one step forward, 18 steps backward with the women's division here? It makes no sense. Mariah May is one of the best. Showcase her. Treat her better than you treat Big Boom AJ, bro. Like, we don't need to see a Big Boom AJ match. I promise you it's not going to generate as much buzz as you think, AEW. I promise you. Showcase your women's division. The people that are there week in, week out, busting their ass. Do that better. I don't want need to see Big Boom AJ. I'd rather see Mariah May defend the championship that I should be invested in. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. I was going to remind everyone Big Boom AJ versus QT Marshall is on this show. Pre-show, but on this show over Anna J versus Mariah May. Let me just, and the one last thing about Big Boom AJ and QT Marshall. I understand what they're doing it for, and they're doing it for the buzz. I checked before we started this uh, recording of today's episode. I had checked. On X, it had gathered like 300 and something interactions. Like, that was it. So, uh, it was uh, the diss track between QT Marshall to Big Boom AJ. Is that really worth it? Are 300,000 interactions and views that much worth that QT Marshall and Big Boom AJ should have the match over your Women's World Champion who would been putting on like consistent work constantly like come on man it just it it's misogynistic honestly yeah i don't know if i'll go that far but you're you're right you are right um yeah so uh quick predictions um i think mercedes retains uh and i think uh big boom aj wins let's move on any your predictions for that <laughs> yeah same here same too all right quickly uh Fatal 4-Way for the AEW World Tag Team Championships. Private Party, their first defense against the Outrunners, against Kings of the Black Throne, and against the Acclaimed. Uh, I think Private Party is going to be retaining. Uh, I think... Well, here's what I'll say. We've talked about Isaiah Cassidy before, possibly going singles. I mean, especially when he put the team on the line without Mark Quinn's permission, per se, without consultation. Uh, it, it it could be a jump start if to Isaiah Cassidy's singles run if they were to lose the titles. Let's say Mark Quinn gets pinned and Isaiah goes ballistic and gets really mad about it. And uh, I think with the Death Riders looming, looming uh, and the pressure that's being put on the whole locker room, I think Isaiah Cassidy could be the diamond that's molded, you know, in all of that. Um, so I don't think it's completely out of the question that private party is going to uh, lose the titles, but I do think they will retain. If I had a choice of who would win them over uh, private party, I would go with the Kings of the Black Throne. Uh, they are great and deserve a lot more than what they're currently given. But Don Lucha, what's your thoughts about this match? Um, honestly, I think having private party win this matchup is the right call. They just won the championships. Like they haven't, um, had a single defense at all to this point. I had just checked and yeah, they have not defended a single time to this point. So I personally don't see them losing it, but if they were to go the route with them splitting up, them losing here would be the perfect call then. Because it would make all the sense for either or to get mad. So mad to the point that they break up because they weren't even able to defend the championships one time at all. As soon as they got them, they dropped them. So it shows, well, maybe we weren't, we weren't really good enough to be tag team champions um, as long as we thought. So I'm going with Private Party. But if I had to pick somebody else winning, 
I'm actually gonna go with the Outrunners, man. <laughs> I think for the shock value, and I think giving the Outrunners a chance to compete with some of the top tag teams uh, with the actual championships around their waist, I think would be a great thing. But I, I don't think we're gonna get that, unfortunately. I think it's gonna be private party retaining. Uh, this match I I've already talked a lot about uh, Hangman Page versus Jay White. I it's listed as a singles match on uh, Wikipedia. I thought they were gonna get more hardcore. Uh, I thought both of them brought that up at some point so i might be I, it might turn into something more uh yeah, but maybe tonight we find out stipulation yeah uh, i hope it turns into something more um uh, the question is do you have hangman get the win back over jay white or do you keep jay white uh riding that high that he got over hangman what do you think don lucha I think you give Hangman the uh, the win back. Um, I just think there's going to be a trilogy of some sort, uh, whether that ends at World's End or it'd be later down the line. Who knows, really? Because AEW seems to like their long-term booking when it comes to Hangman. So who knows when we'll get that third match. But honestly, I think Hangman should win this. Um, I think you gave the first one to Jay, so it's only right if you give Hangman this one so that they can have a third one because... I love every time these guys get in the ring together. I don't think we've seen them much uh, in the ring, just a few times together, but they don't disappoint. Their first match uh, or their last match at the pay-per-view was fantastic, and I'm sure they're going to do the same thing. So I'm going to go with Hangman Adam Page this time around. You know, uh, if you applied that logic one year ago, Swerve Strickland beat Hangman at Wrestle Dream, and then he beat Hangman at Full Gear. I don't think it's out of question sure. that Jay White could sure. do the same thing and continue to elevate him towards world title and towards C2 uh, big-time status. Uh, remember, that's what led Swerve into the C2 and riding that momentum, people wanting to see him win that tournament um, in the Gold League, I think he was. Uh, my actual answer is Hangman gets the win back. Uh, I think the old, the, penal, the uh, trilogy concludes inside the continental classic i think they, they should be in the same block and i think the match that they fight should be determining who wins that block i know some people want Takeshita versus okada to be the finals of the c2 and i can't argue against that but right now with uh Takeshita as the international champion we are putting that on the back burner from what i see uh i'm not sure who Oka who uh, either hangman or jay white would be in the finals against uh, if I had to guess, Hangman is going to be in the finals of that, rather. But uh, I think that would be a better. Um, I think that would be a good spot for their trilogy, you know. And and play also into New Japan history, Okada versus Omega. Their third match was during the G1 tournament, and that was a very pivotal uh, match in their trilogy because Kenny Omega finally got a pinfall victory over Okada during that. Um, either way, let's uh, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say the, the C2 is going to be interesting. I, I have a feeling that there's going to be some big names left off because unfortunately, man, we only have 12 spots and AEW has way more than 12 people that deserve to be in this tournament. So um, it's just going to be interesting to see who is the final field we should be finding out soon. Yeah. And then the last match that I do want to spend a little bit of time, sorry if we run over, MJF versus Roderick Strong. Because Roderick Strong had some, uh, I'm not going to call them easy opponents, but they certainly <laughs> were not at the same level as uh, Adam Cole's opponents. And Adam Cole beat uh, Buddy Matthews, beat Malachi Black in a very interesting match the thing about those two matches is that uh the crowd were cheering for adam cole's opponents during those two matches they wanted to see buddy win then they wanted to see malachi win so what they did for adam cole's final match the third against the international champion Takeshita, to make sure <laughs> that the crowd was going to be on adam cole's side he starts brawling with Takeshita because Takeshita jumped, I think, Roderick Strong after he won his third match against Lance Archer. Uh, Takeshita blindsides him. Adam Cole comes out. Here comes the music. They continue fighting. Start of the match. The music's still going. And Adam Cole knocked Takeshita outside just in time enough to do the boom with uh, the crowd. Oh, yeah. That kind of like, hey, we need you to be with this guy. Please cheer <laughs> with him. Do his thing. <laughs> But 
Adam Cole lost that match, and I think that was the right call. I don't think he should have been in the match with Takeshita, to be honest with you. Uh, if you were going to have him get into the full gear match against MJF, but uh, him losing to Takeshita, I think, was absolutely the correct call. I just don't know if MJF versus Roderick Strong should be on pay-per-view. What do you think? I think I'm going to agree with you, bro, that Takeshka winning was absolutely the right call just because if you don't have him win here, since he had won the title at Wrestle Dream, his only matches in AEW, he would have lost both. And I just feel like that would have been detrimental to him and his championship reign if he would have had uh, Takeshka lose against Adam Cole. But on the other end, as you say, is Roderick Strong MJF enough to really be on this pay per view for real? Like, I don't think so. I think that's a good enough dynamite main event, if you want, or a dynamite open. But I just don't think it's enough to uh, be on this pay per view because, to like, I'm not really that like invested into this. Like, I know it's probably going to be a great match for sure. But I personally, I just feel like I would have rather see either Adam Cole in this uh, match itself or not at all. I would rather not see this match at all and rather it be replaced with, like we mentioned before, a Mariah May matchup is, uh, instead. But in terms of this match, uh, if I had to give you a prediction right now, I'm just going to go ahead and say MJF wins because well, I think that's the obvious choice. Yeah. It's, it's just, I don't, if this is just a match or nothing else, hate that. This has to have an angle to it. And Kyle O'Reilly's been involved in this as well. He's been watching yes. Adam Cole's matches, and he saved Cole uh, at the end of his match, I want to say, afterwards. Uh, I think they were going to continue to beat down Cole, and yeah. then O'Reilly made the save. Uh, but then, but also, this is stupid, but also O'Reilly, when Adam Cole went to shake his hand, O'Reilly just, like, brushed it off because he's had a history of Adam Cole, which, yes, he does have a history of Adam Cole, turning on him and uh, Cole turning on O'Reilly and NXT and things like that, right? But the last time we saw these two characters on screen, on screen together, they were friends. They were buddy-buddy. That's why it doesn't make sense. So this is – it's just bad. It's just bad. It's, it's lazy. Truly, it's lazy. It's what it is. It's – um. I I want. First off, I'm surprised Adam Cole, and I'm sure AEW is also surprised by this, and that's made them scramble in this booking and whatever. That the crowd is not cheering for Adam Cole, that they are cheering for his opponents, but that's also kind of how I knew for putting him against some pretty cool people that are universally beloved by wrestling fans. So, like, what did you expect? Um, I don't know. Do you think Cole's in ring prowess is? at where it used to be like do you think he's still as good as he was when he was the nxt champion or do you think that he right now is uh getting back on his feet after that ankle injury i don't want to be the one to like kind of speak too soon and because i know he just came back but we got to be realistic man he missed like almost a year if not more because of the ankle injury and i believe he had to have like a whole other bone inserted into his foot in order for it to be like repaired and whatnot i don't don't know the the full details but i just think it's a case of we're not going to be getting the adam cole that we once knew and loved because it's one injury too many unfortunately and like truth be told like we our body is undefeated like our body will always tell us when something's right, when something's wrong, or and it'll show us exactly when we've lost a step or two. And I think it's unfortunate, but I think I have to say it may be the case of Adam Cole might have lost a step or two um, because of his unfortunate injury history. But it doesn't necessarily mean that Adam Cole is going to put up stinkers um, left and right. It's just I don't think we're going to be getting that one like spectacular style that we all once knew. It's unfortunate, but I think that's the reality. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for joining us here on the Mostly Wrestling Podcast. Uh, feel free to watch El Don Lucha on his YouTube channel with the Lucha Lounge. Drops a podcast every week, I want to say. Uh, very entertaining listening. You get uh, boys from the MWP pod like uh, Jack on there. So definitely go check that out. Uh, 
did you uh, were you thinking of a live stream for Full Gear, or is that out of the question? So for sure, it, um, I won't be home for uh, Full Gear. Uh, I'll be away. Actually, I'll be back home in Chicago, but That's I won't right. be here with all my setup and all. So uh, it won't be the case for Full Gear, but. I believe the next one is Survivor Series War Games the week after. Next, yes, and yes. I should be home for that. Let's hopefully so get something going there. Again. Maybe, so yeah, hopefully. Um, but uh, next week, guys, we'll we'll talk about the best thing in pro wrestling right now, and that's uh, that's clearly the Miz and Karrion Cross because I'm actually <laughs> genuinely it's the best thing that's happening in WWE right now. Okay, wow, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we got most of these coming up too in a month or so too. Most. <laughs> uh, be- best uh, re comeback, The Miz. Love it. He's, yeah, the, Miz. He's, the last two weeks of him, three weeks, including his kidnapping, been great. Honestly, love it. <laughs> love it. Um, he's getting genuine heat. Like, I haven't seen Miz get genuine heat for a while. So it's. it's Shout uh, out Karrion Cross too. He's doing this thing now. It seems like he's. He's turned it up a bit. He's found the new gears. Shout when he's him. not wrestling, he's really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for joining us here on the Mostly Wrestling Podcast. My name is Drake. been joined by El Don Lucha, and that was Mostly Predictions. Mostly Boom. <laughs>